Hello. Is everybody asleep? Are we all okay? Okay. So as I said, I'm Mary. Um, I'm South African originally. If I start to talk far too fast, everybody just do this, and I'll try and slow down. But I, I do talk too quickly sometimes. Um, and I'm from a, um, a hardware hacking background. Um, so I, at the age of 15, built part of South Africa's first satellite, which we're a poor enough country that we had to have our satellite go in as ballast on a US satellite. So I think that basically was just like there to make up the weight um, <laughs> to get it into space. Um, who's got kids? My, I'm not a parent yet, but my advice to you is don't let them do anything cool when they're young. I soldered something that went into space when I was 15. I, I basically, it's all fucking downhill from there, right? <laughs> I can never be as cool as I was as a 15-year-old. Um, so I ended up in the UK, studied computer science, ended up mostly in artificial intelligence, um, so which is, you know, mostly all of those people are doing big data these days. Um, but I stumbled into Procter & Gamble and ended up there for a bunch of years. I wrote a book about project management, which is completely unrelated to performance and uh, therefore in no way worth pimping to you guys today. Um, and since then, I've also been, I was part of the team that built uh, GovUK, helped scale them up to, to do the government digital service. Um, I curate and host uh, the lead developer conference. And I, seven weeks ago, started as the CTO for MS Digital, which looks after all of our consumer-facing technology for Marks & Spencer, which is a retailer in the UK. Um, and so I don't need to tell this room that performance matters, um, but, but I think we, we care about it, uh, as Tobias has just been saying, about more from a technical point of view. Uh, and I find it more interesting to think about it from the other point of view, that we, we like to believe that people are completely focused when they're using our sites, right? Um, and uh, basically, we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves. Um, most, most people are trying to do 17 different things at once. Um, and, and so if we think that it's you know, genuinely the, the core focus of, of their day to, to use our website, then, then we are wrong. Um, and the two most useful stats that I've found in helping everybody care equally about performance um, are these two. One, that 75% of users will leave a site that takes more than five seconds to load. That's very... Um, focuses the attention of your uh, CEO of your dot-com company very quickly <laughs> on, on how, how performance is important when they, when they see that. Uh, and I love this one that almost 40% of people have, been ta you know, have ended up uh, cursing, shouting, or, or throwing their phones when something takes too long. Um, it ma makes it feel a lot more real um, to people. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a couple of anti-patterns of things that we tend to do wrong when we're trying to make uh, performance p and making performance matter part of our day-to-day -day work, particularly in an agile setting, um, but mostly a bunch of patterns of how we can do this well. And so we all know performance is really important, but I think very often what I see is teams trying to only worry about it right at the end. They'll build their new feature, they'll try to try to get a new release ready, um, and then right at the end they're suddenly like, oh, did we check that it doesn't slow down everything by like 10 seconds? Um, and sadly the answer is, is often not. I'm now a little worried that that has stopped because it usually keeps going. There we go. And so I, I feel so strongly that about this being an anti-pattern that we shouldn't leave these things right to the end and only worry about them um, after the fact that I, I have like a double nope gift for you, right? I have the badger. Oh, and again. See, when I, I tested ahead of time that my gifts would all work and then I'm screwing it up now, which is kind of sad. Um, so note badger and note llama would like you not to leave it right to the end, please. Um, and so again, rather than rather than worrying about it afterwards or not worrying about it at all, which a lot of teams seem to do, um, let's talk about how we bake it into our process. And this one feels a little bit kumbaya, but the first thing is to write down your team values. Get everybody together and say, what do we care about? Um, and there's some good examples of this, like, refactor as you go, the, the Boy Scout rule is one that a lot of teams will, will pick of leave everything better than you found it. Um, do your refactoring as part of new feature development rather than letting tech debt accumulate. Um, another one that's quite popular in a lot of my teams is the, the no seagulls rule. Is everybody familiar with the seagull style of management? Fly in, shout at everybody, shit on everything, fly away again? It's clearly not as popular here as in, uh, 
in Holland. That gets like, it takes a minute for everybody to calm down after I say that. Um, but the other thing that, that a lot of teams get to is, well, you know, do they care about from a, from a technical honor and um, craftsmanship point of view, they do care about things being fast. And getting that to be something that uh, your, your individual teams articulate is something they care about is really, um, is really helpful. And the other thing that almost, I, I'm hard pressed to find a team that shouldn't care about this is making user experience something that you say this matters to us and we will do what we need to to, to make sure that it's there. Um, and so making make caring about the user experience part of your values. There was a great question in this room earlier today um, uh, to, to Barbara about how do you get the designers to care. You want designers to care about performance. You have them sit in on two sessions of user research on a phone with 3G. They will care so much about performance, you will not get them to shut up about it ever again. Because watching, watching any end user try to access any website on 3G um, makes you care an awful lot very quickly about, about performance of websites. So please, please make caring about the user something that you, your teams talk about um, and that you talk about. And that helps you make performance something that's intrinsic in, in how, you, uh, how you build things. The next thing that's a pretty useful pattern is to arrange work as deliberate practice. And the, there's this term of deliberate practice is becoming more accepted. Who's read Outliers? One, two, okay. Um, it's a little bit pop sci and a little skimmy over the details. T Talent is overrated is a, a better review of the psychology literature and, and, and things like that. I'll, I'll post these slides and links to all the books afterwards in case anybody's worried about forgetting the titles. Um, What's what's really interesting um, in in all of this field of study is that people went looking for something that they genuinely believed existed, which was talent. And a lot of the research started in places where everybody really believes that talent is a factor, like music. So they went to the best violin school in the world and said, um, "Who are your future world-class um, soloists and orchestras? Who who's going to play in a world-class orchestra, but they might not be um, a soloist?" and who are your music teachers um, of the future, and looked at what the difference between them was. And this is where the 10,000 hour rule stuff comes from, of there just being an inordinate number, and it, what, what gets lost over a lot when, when you see the kind of Harvard Business Review or um, a little bit too uh, popular science kind of articles is the type of practice it was. It's not just spend a lot of time doing a thing, it's spend a lot of time doing the thing you will learn the most from. So with violin players, it's individual practice, which every violin player I know tells me is the worst part of playing the violin. The playing with the orchestra is much more interesting and much more engaging. But the thing that's most likely to predict how good you're gonna be is how much time you spend practicing on your own. Um, the, there's, a, there's another great example which is about um, the different sports and where having uh, access from, a, from an early age matters. Um, and the, the kind of canonical story is I was watching ice hockey. I assume he was Canadian. Um, I, I love that Canada's like this massively progressive, uh, liberal country. They've just put a parliament in place that has the best representation of any uh, like set of politicians you've ever seen in the world. But their major like sport is just about beating the shit out of people. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, ice hockey, in fairness, though, isn't quite as violent as water polo, which is the sport I grew up playing and why I ended up as a bouncer in my later years. Um, but this guy was watching hockey match, his wife was clearly not enjoying it quite as much, she was reading the program, and said, it's really weird that they're all born at the same time. And he was like, it's not true. This one's 24 and this one's like 19, and wow, look at how hard he just hit that guy. Um, and, but then she said, no, that's not what I mean. They're all born in January or February. And this piqued his interest and he went and did a bunch of research into it and found that in, in fact, it was really true that almost all of the pro ice hockey players who had grown up in North America were born in January and February. And through a bunch of research, eventually worked out that this is because in Canada, you start your, your uh, childhood sport of beating the crap out of somebody else at the tender age of four. Um, and when you're four and you're born in January or February, you're the oldest in your school year. 
And the difference between a four-year-old and a five-year-old in like coordination and heft is quite significant. And so you're a lot better at ice hockey if you start and you are four years and 11 months old than if you are four years and zero months old. Um, but what's interesting is that that snowballs over time. So because you're good when you're really little, you get to play more often, you get to play weekends, you get selected for the first team, you're doing practice in the morning before school, you, you get a lot more opportunity to get better and you get a lot more opportunity to perform. Um, and the counter example um, that's really interesting is basketball because ice hockey, you need a lot of things. You need ice, you need... Um, presumably a lot of armor, um, <laughs> you, you, need, uh, you need the puck and the stick, whatever that is called. Like, you can tell I came from Africa, right? I have no idea what all of these ice-related sports um, are about. Um, and you also need a whole bunch of other people to beat the crap out of, evidently. And that's not very easy to kind of rustle up in your backyard. Whereas basketball, you can pretty much improve your skills in basketball as long as you have a ball. And if you have a hoop, then you're doing even better than, <laughs> the, than expected, right? And so you, you, can, you can get deliberate practice in some activities without needing a team, in some sports without needing that um, more detailed uh, or kind of structured setup. And so the core thing to know, though, is that we're good at what we practice, providing we can learn from it, and that the definition of practice is quite specific. And so you need to be, you need to want to do it and want to exert the effort to improve your performance. You should, should take into account your existing knowledge. You should get immediate informative feedback and repeatedly perform the same or similar tasks. Um, and that's what I think is really interesting is... Um, when you ask people whether their day-to-day -day work as a professional is designed for them to learn from it in this way, I've never found anybody who's like, yes, I have that nailed. That's exactly what I do every day. If you, if you are that person, I want to talk to you. I want to interview you because I would love a great example of this. Um, but but we, we, we're very good when we're kids and when we're at school at designing experiences that we learn a lot from and that we get a lot out of. Um, we seem to be a lot worse as adults of actually designing our environment and our work that we learn the most possible from it. Um, and so there's three different models of deliberate practice. The sports model where you go, you know, how can you get a lot better at rugby? You lift a lot of weights, you do a lot of sprinting, you eat a lot of meat, um, you bulk up a lot, and, and you try and still be as fast as Brian Habana. So you can get good at individual skills, which on the field, um, those individual things help you to perform better. Um, there's the chess model where you go, what did somebody who's really good at this do? I suppose the equivalent in our world is reading blog posts and trying to reapply that. Um, and the, the music model is to go, let's break down the, the sub parts of performing really well um, and learn how to do those one at a time. So when you learn a piece of music, you tend to learn uh, one stanza at a time or you learn the chorus and then the, and then the, the word for... The other parts has just gone completely out of my head, so that's making my English look brilliant. Um, I'm not going to swap into Dutch because that will upset everybody. Um, but if you think about these three different models and whether your whether your day to day is designed that way, um, and whether we're enabling not just our individuals but also our teams to learn from that, and so I think something I see a lot to bring it back to what we're talking about today, which is performance. We're we're quite good at going, hey, I found this blog post. It's great, right? Um, or I listened to an interesting talk and there's some things I think we should do. But we're not always brilliant at building it into our day-to-day -day so that we're, we're learning every time we make a change, so we're learning every time we put a new feature in, um, or that we're rem remembering to do that. Um, so the other part of the pattern is as a, so both help design the work for the team and the work for the individuals to be better to learn from. Um, but also to help the team to stop and look back at how they're operating and to learn from that as well. So retrospectives, uh, which are an agile practice of just going, what worked well, what didn't, and what might we choose to do differently um, are, really, are really useful. Um, and remembering in a team where you've said, hey, everybody, let's talk about what we care about and let's, have some, let's articulate those values, um, remembering to talk about whether we're keeping to them uh, is something that's useful in a retro as well. As a quick aside, um, 
do retros rather than postmortems. Something has to die to do a postmortem. Um, it, re it, re it really worries me every time people start talking about postmortem reviews, um, even of incidents. Like we, it's just it just feels like a it, it feels like we're trying to kill someone or assess why something was murdered every time. Another pattern is to do performance testing katas. So make it so much part of the um, the normal way of doing things that people can do them almost automatically. Um, one thing I like to do with teams is to help them when they're spiking a, a new feature or um, trying to decide what the best approach for, for a new uh, kind of need is. Um, do it on a four-year-old phone with a 3G connection. People very quickly um, start to realize that, that maybe the, the, the bright and shiny thing that they were planning is, is going to be not brilliant from a, from a user experience point of view. Or better yet, look into your your own um, stats and see what the what the device connection browser combo is with the highest bounce rate. So who's coming and getting so frustrated with your site that they're leaving almost immediately? See if you can get your bounce rate by your kind of combination of devices and connections, and see who's having the worst experience right now. And try testing from their point of view. It's part of development. It's part of when you're when you're writing a new feature. But I think the, the thing that helps the best in terms of this deliberate practice approach and also the, um, the immediate feedback loop is to get your testing, tooling, and infra instrumentation in place. And we, we talk about automating all the things. I love this quote that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. These are, thing, these are, these are things we know how to do. We have all these tools. <laughs> we have all these approaches. Um, but I find so few teams that have it as part of their continuous integration, as part of their build process, as part of their um, route to production um, for, for new features in their, on their website or in their app. Um, and, and I think that that's, like, that's the thing that we can actually most usefully do to really improve um, put performance across the web would probably be to build these things in and to more evenly distribute the things that, that we already know. Um, it's not rocket surgery, as one of my friends likes to say. Um, and so if you want to, if you take the approach of saying, how do we make sure this team knows that they are making things better and not worse? We have web page test, we have sites speed io we have grafana we have you know there's a there's a whole bunch of companies very willing to take your money to give you a software as a service appro approach to to help with this as well um, but i find so few teams that actually have it integrated into their their tooling and ways of working and instrumentation there are a great many people who go i think this is a this is a great new feature it's going to it's going to be brilliant for our users and they don't know until it's live a month later that it slowed everything down by 3 seconds um, because, like somebody said earlier, they're testing on a high-performance machine on a high-performing network connection uh, in the latest browser, um, and it's their job. So they're not trying to, um, you know, keep in control of the hoovering cat while it happens. So the other thing to do is to define done appropriately, and make sure that we're not that that we know that making sure that it's going to perform well is part of it being finished. Um, when you do that, it's really easy to walk out of a, um, a conference like this one or like Velocity and go back and just be like, everybody is shit. <laughs> They're all just doing it wrong. So, so, so the other thing to remember is that all humans, fractal primates, I think this is fairly universal, go through a process. They go through a series of stages when they're learning to do anything well. And it's a lot like learning to drive. So initially, you're unconsciously incompetent. You're doing it wrong, and you don't even know it. You move on to being consciously incompetent. Learner drivers are still crap at driving, but at least now they know what they're doing wrong. They're wincing every time they grind the gears, or slide the car, or whatever. And then they eventually get to being consciously competent. So somebody who's just passed their driver's license, they will never again exert so much attention and effort in driving well as they do immediately after passing their test. And you get to the point, though, where you're unconsciously competent. I can't remember the last time I actually remember my commute, because I am just able to drive without thinking about it. I'm mostly able to, like, I haven't, I haven't had a crash, so I'm <laughs> not killing anybody, but it's not taking a lot of my active attention. So the other thing that's 
interesting about this, um, and Kathy Sierra has written ab about a great deal uh, that's very interesting, is the people who are already unconsciously getting it right, they're automatically doing the right thing, they might be the worst people to teach in your team. So if you've got somebody who is, every time they, they uh, build a new feature, it automatically seems to be high performing, um, accessible, and progressively enhanced, like all of, the, all of the things that we would like things to be on the web. Um, sometimes they're not even able to articulate how they're getting it right for somebody more junior who needs to learn from them. And sometimes finding the person who can better coach is about finding someone who's still got to concentrate to do it well, and they can teach the people who are a little bit further behind a lot better. One final anti-pattern, though, is this, uh, this tendency to say, it's going to cost you extra. Um, I, I have a massive, massive bugbear about this, um, to the point it makes me deploy the best cat gif in the history of the internet, uh, which is fuck this thing in particular. We should not be saying that making something fast is an optional extra. We should not be having this, um, the kind of conversation you have with your mechanic, where you go, how, how much will it be to make it roadworthy? And they go, it's going to cost you. But we do. We, we have those conversations. And I see so many agencies and so many in-house teams having conversations like making something accessible is an extra. Having some kind of quality strategy is an extra. Having, having things that are, that are fast shouldn't be an extra. It's, it isn't that it doesn't take work, but our professional pride should make us plan that into the process rather than make it extra. Um, so I'll not get too heated about that because I appreciate I'm in Sweden and I'm clearly a little hot-blooded for, for here, um, not least with the swearing. Um, and then the final pattern is to, is to measure reality. As I mentioned earlier, I've just joined uh, Marks and Spencer as their, their, to lead their tech, their tech team. Um, and I've actually been really pleasantly surprised in this, in this particular area. So there's a guy called Andy Nielsen, um, who's just done a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago at, at Velocity, um, who's been leading our PerfOps team. Um, and so they've not only um, been doing some great work in this area, but he's been doing some amazing work on instrumenting our actual live, in, in reality user experience. So we've got plenty of testing that shows us what a synthetic, like a, a proposed or a imagined user would experience. Um, but he's also got us to the point where we've got instrumentation that shows us what's actually happening for our real users on um, on the both on the sites, on the apps, all the different ways that, that our customers interact with us. Um, and I thought today I'd, I, I'm, I'm mostly going to say that that talk is, is brilliant. The slides are up. Uh, I think the video is about to be up shortly, so I'd, I'd recommend going and watching it. Andy, Andy did a really good job. Um, but I would, thought I would share just a couple of the examples um, that he includes um, that I thought were really fascinating as I joined m and and, and had a look at them. Um, so one of the insights that we found was that actually our tablet performance is the worst right now. Um, we we are a little bit reliant on Angular. It doesn't work brilliantly um, on Apple tablets in particular. Um, and so, our, you know, if this is our, our how fast have you got the experience we want as we want, we want as quick a bulge as possible? And actually, this one, the green one, is not brilliant. But what we see in the UK is in the evenings. Um, Tablet's pretty much our most popular device by far. Um, partic particularly, what's in the, the demographic behavior seems to be that anybody over 50, they're shopping on a tablet from 7 o'clock onwards. Um, and so we, we, this helps us to realize that one of our, one of our areas we most needed to focus on was, was making um, tablet better. And in a world where people are just kind of adjusting to the idea that non-desktop is a thing, um, this was really, really useful to do. Um, I, I love this one. We, uh, we thought we had an issue because we saw a sudden drop off in traffic until we realized that it was the solar eclipse and so everybody had put their, put their devices down and gone outside. <laughs> um, which is kind of awesome, right? <laughs> Um, we we actually went outside and looked at the, we looked at the, we looked at the the, the sun disappearing, um, 
but it but it's been really uh, it's been really interesting to to see that to see that starting to happen. The the other thing that's interesting in this as well actually is even in the middle of the night where there's not a lot of traffic, we've got a lot of strange slowing down happening, um, and so we went and had a had a look into that as well. Um, and then the, this one was great. So we saw a massive drop off in traffic and a massive increase in um, the length of journey or the length of loading for people. And we had a third party tag issue. We had some marketing tags that were slowing everything right down. Um, somebody had let something go into production in a way that it um, that it was really really slowing things. I think we'd. My recollection is that we'd. Um, accidentally turned off async for a load of third party things that were loading um and so it was uh, it was blocking um blocking the render um but this kind of monitoring helped us find it and figure out what was up and then and then fix it very swiftly um but the other thing that i would include is we are we have proven with beyond a shadow of a doubt that making things faster makes more money um we were able to see that the every every half second that we reduced the the um, improve the speed, um, we see both customer satisfaction go up, we see abandoned baskets go down, and we see completed tra transactions go up. And so it's also brilliant for me coming in new as a into an organisation to not have to start this fight, not not have to begin this conversation, because we've already got the instrumentation that shows us um, that whenever we invest in performance, whenever we make things faster, it pretty much immediately um, converts into actual actual pounds um, and actual improvement in, in sales and customer satisfaction and engagement. And so, to summarize, um, Bake these good practices in. Don't just think about what's the technical thing that needs to be done. Think about how you make it part of how people work every day, day by day. Um, help. It, it, it is generally better to help a team decide what they care about than to tell them what they care about. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, encourage folks to value the user experience, including performance. But as I said earlier, if you want to convert anybody to caring, just have them watch some user research that's happening on a on a slow connection or a two-year-old device. Uh, very, very, very quickly they will be converted. Um, arrange your workers' deliberate practice and figure out whether people need to get better at chunks automatically doing the right thing, whether it's like sports, where they could go and develop some skills that would then be useful in a different context, um, or more like that chess model of, this isn't this isn't rocket surgery. <laughs> we could just see what the right thing to do is and adopt it. We could look at a, we could find a grandmaster. Um, you've been listening to some of them today. Um, various people I'm going to try and bribe to come and uh, do talks at my for my team as well. Um, do performance testing carters help people, especially junior folks, to know how to test this as part of the development that they're doing? Um, help your designers know how to think about performance, and you'll immediately see the team come together in a, in a better way. Integrate your perf testing into CI, CD, instrument, instrumentation, tooling, and define done appropriately, but remember that Nobody does this perfectly every time straight off the bat. People need time to develop those skills and go from unconsciously incompetent to unconsciously competent. No, nobody gets there automatically. And then re measure the synthetic and the actual user experience of performance, because it's great to have the tools that we have, but it's even better when you can measure what, what end users are really experiencing and see the see the connection to the commercials as part of that, um, very similar to what Tobias was saying a minute ago. And finally, just be awesome, but remember that performance matters. We, we, can, all, we can all be so much better at this. Um, we just have to make it part of how we work rather than an additional extra or a mechanic type uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, so do we have any questions? <laughs> no question, <laughs> just an escape. <laughs> yeah. It was so bad, he must leave immediately. No, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> cool. 
Okay, so uh, I have a one question. Okay, okay yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what do you think? How, how long time? I mean, uh, so getting people into into the, the culture and and getting everything done. So, I mean, um, where should I actually start? Say uh, I'm coming to a company and then. So my oh, oh, oh. my approach tends to be one team at a time, um, and I think getting one team to have the right tooling so that they know when they're making things better or worse um, is the is the thing that tends to start moving things around. One product owner really caring about performance and making sure that the stories that relate to that are automatically high up in the backlog is really useful. Um, and as soon as you've got one team that are showing that their business KPIs are improving because they've improved the... Um, the speed of you know their, whether it's their part of the site or their app or whatever the, that team looks after, um, and then them sharing. Um, it, it's it's very much about it being unevenly distributed. You'll find in any big organization, you'll find a team that has somebody who really cares about this stuff, who keeps up to date, who reads all of the um, all of the literature, um, and they're you know like. 10 years ahead of, of all the other teams and finding that, amplifying that and helping people have the, the, the tools ten, tends, to me the, to, tends to be the thing that makes a big difference. And then the best thing is when you get to a point where teams are asking for help getting better at this, where they're coming and going, that team over there has got it integrated into their build process so they know, could we have it integrated into ours? The minute somebody's in that mode, it, it's their idea. They want to make it happen, and they're keen to get help. Um, you get adoption a hell of a lot faster than if you go out and try and kind of order everybody to do better. Or um, what I've seen sometimes, and it goes a little bit wrong, is people to set um, measures uh, where then people will do anything to hit the measure, um, and you've got to be really careful about about that. You end up with a lot of what what are called watermelon metrics, where they're green on the outside and bright red on the inside, where the, the number that you've told people matters has been made perfect, but all the actual user experience is fucking terrible because people have just gone for the number, not for the the actual experience that needs to be better. You always have a question. It's fine. You, would you recommend having like a evangelist team inside a company that, that spearheads this development, or would you recommend placing the head of performance on one person inside each team? Um, so what what we have done is to have Andy, and he has a small a small team of folks who can help um, guide all the other all the other teams, um, and then we expect each team to care. Um, so we we enable them by having a small team in the in the center that just like solves the problem once rather than 20 teams going off and trying to solve the same problem in term for something like having um, you know performance budget uh, measurement in the build process it's better for there to be good guidance on that rather than everybody trying to start from scratch on it um, but and I, but I'd echo what was said earlier that having good analysts can be really, really helpful. Um, and what we find is a lot of our product owners are quite into their analysis. So they're, they're looking at the numbers and they're, they're judging it from that. And they just need sufficient guidance. Um, I think if it were a much smaller organization, I'd probably have um, the other approach of have somebody in each team because we wouldn't then have the capacity to support having a kind of small expert team that helps all the other teams. Anybody else? Okay, cool. so thank you, Mary. Thanks so much.